Good afternoon, North Dakota. Uh, I want to start off with some gratitude uh, for all of you that are tuning in regularly, whether you're watching uh, live or whether you're watching on the replay, uh, because we know we've got a lot of folks, get a lot of notes, cards, letters, calls, uh, texts uh, from folks that are watching. And I just want to say thank you for, for tuning in because you're part of the team that's helping uh, get North Dakota through this crisis that we're going through and your attention uh, <clears throat> makes a real difference. Uh, for the press that's here, I want to say thanks for being here and those that are online. As you know, when we left here uh, under 24 hours ago yesterday, we hadn't planned on having a, a press conference, but we've got a significant increase in cases again in North Dakota today. Uh, we've also got a specific outbreak uh, at a, a manufacturing facility in Grand Forks. Uh, and we want to give you an update on everything that the state is doing uh, to respond to that. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing I want to do, though, of course, is though even though we've had this significant increase, is assure everyone uh, that this is the moment that we expected to happen. As we talked about before, uh, from the early days of this thing, that there was going to come a time uh, when you've got something this contagious where you could have doublings, and we. Uh, you know, doubled, nearly doubled from uh, 28 to 46 cases uh, from Wednesday to Thursday, uh, or excuse me, Thursday to uh, Friday. And, and then, then uh, today uh, we're reporting 90 uh, new cases in the 24 hour period that occurred on Friday. So almost a doubling again. Uh, we're gonna have on a call today, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Brown, Mayor of Grand Forks, Dr. Stephen Weiser, President of All True from Grand Forks. And then when we get into Q&A uh, for the media, we've got uh, our state health officer, Mylan Tufty, here, as well as uh, Major General Alan Dorman, who is the leading the, uh, co-leading the Unified Command and also leads emergency services for North Dakota. Uh, let's take a look at the numbers. <clears throat> uh, 90 new positives, so again, uh, far and away our biggest uh, single day. Uh, <clears throat> that comes out of uh, 621 tests, so we had a very positive testing day uh, yesterday. Again, in terms of test counts, we still want to keep getting number of tests taken to go up and up. Uh, but you know, I'm sure in the upper right-hand corner of the slide, it jumps out at you that 14.5% in terms of our today's positive rate. That's our first double-digit day uh, that we've had, uh, and we didn't, you know, we jumped right into double digits there. Uh, fairly strongly. It's the fourth consecutive day uh, in a row that we've had our highest number of positive cases. So again, we're in that point that we've talked about, which is the, the curve ramping up. In the lower right-hand corner, you see the 4.1%. Uh, That's the uh, trailing average rate, which had always been trailing about uh, around 3%. 3, 3.1, now it's jumped a full point. Uh, on the last uh, four days, we are no longer the uh, second lowest in the nation. We're now the fifth lowest. Uh, we're behind Hawaii, Alaska, Montana, and West Virginia. Uh, but with a good testing effort, we're back at that number 10th among states on per capita testing. And we want to, again, continue through things we can control, which is how much testing we do, working with all the providers to make sure that we stay in the top 10 of, of tests taken per capita. On the, the next slide, uh, we want to talk about the number of actives. We're now at 336 active cases. Uh, that's a, a significant rise from yesterday. And out of the 528 positives, we've seen 183 people recover. We've uh, sadly seen nine deaths. And currently, we've got 13 people hospitalized. That's down a couple uh, from yesterday. And again, these are all numbers through midnight uh, last night. When we take a look at the uh, case trends, uh, you'll again see here uh, how that uh, 90 uh, new cases, we had 11 recovered, so we had a net rise of plus 79 in active cases there on the end, uh, far and away our steepest increase that we've had uh, since we began uh, uh, dealing with this pandemic. And so again, uh, this doesn't uh, change uh, anything in terms of our, our guidance that we're giving, uh, but again, want to assure people that uh, we were uh, well prepared and well positioned for this. One of the key things 
uh, that we have spent the, the weeks waiting for was to make or preparing for in the last weeks was to make sure we had enough hospital capacity and we certainly do have uh, w working uh, across all of the providers in the state and all the work that's done at the state level that we have enough staff we have enough equipment we've got enough ventilators we have enough IC beds uh, to handle a surge so we're well prepared in that regard uh, from a state it'll require if needed it'll require coordination among providers and by the state but again I want the public to know that uh, that as you can see uh, in most cases do not require hospitalization but if they do uh, we'll be ready uh, <clears throat> again another reason why we're here today is to provide an update on the situation in Grand Forks and our response to that and uh, in LM Wind Power, which is owned by General Electric or GE, uh, they make uh, rotor blades uh, for wind turbines. Uh, as I've said earlier, I've had a chance to tour this facility. Uh, the work that they do there and that their team does is really precision work and really amazing. Uh, you know, we see wind blades from a, a distance and it's uh, one thing to gaze across the prairie and see them, it's another thing to walk right up next to one that's 63 meters long, uh, which is to say that uh, they're you know almost 190 feet in length, uh, and uh, they you put them on a put them down on a football field and they would cover uh, almost two thirds of the length of a field, and so they're uh, that's just one blade. So really incredible uh, what they're doing up there in terms of their manufacturing capability. Uh, and uh, the plan employs uh, close to 900 people. Uh, GE and LM uh, found out on, uh, on Tuesday uh, or Wednesday, I guess it was, that they had eight employees who tested positive. Uh, they shut down the plant. They started shutting it down, I think, Tuesday night and Wednesday, uh, and that plant has been closed since then. Uh, and they've uh, committed uh, that they're going to uh, keep that plant closed for a minimum of 14 days. Uh, when we heard that about the eight employees who tested positive, which we talked about here at the conference, uh, we quickly dispatched a rapid response team uh, <clears throat> to Grand Forks. They, got, they uh, left uh, and headed up there uh, early uh, that day and connected with uh, Grand Forks Public Health Department Director Nurse Debbie Swanson. Uh, the team that we sent from the state included two, two, two co-leaders from North Dakota National Guard and then also uh, from people from Southwest Public Health District. There was another 25 uh, guardsmen uh, that attended, guard members, uh, guard, guard men and women, but the guard members, uh, 15 National Guard members that were helping with traffic control, 10 more that were helping with testing. We had six public nurses that came over and helped from the Devil's Lake District, two nurses from Grand Forks Public Health, five public health official specialists from the CDC, four local police to assist in traffic control, and all the required equipment and supplies. So mobilizing a significant effort to get up there and in conjunction with Grand Forks Public Health, the team conducted drive-through testing in the LM Wind Power parking lot on Thursday of 426 individuals that were tested in total. Uh, that exceeded the amount that we got done in the Stark County and Slope County tests earlier, which again was a good effort to, for us to uh, build this sort of muscle, if you will, or this capability to do this. Uh, in terms of the testing that's been accomplished so far, uh, the uh, of the 426 tests that were taken uh, in the LM parking lot drive-through testing, 374 of those have, have made it through the lab. Uh, results confirming 88 positive cases associated with LM wind power and of these 88 cases uh, it, 66 of those uh, were in today's count so that means 22 of them came after midnight there are uh, an additional uh, <clears throat> 22 cases that were confirmed uh, either by local testing at all true uh, with the on-premise testing that is now being deployed uh, and so that's how we get the uh, up to the uh, to the, the 110 uh, number. Uh, we know uh, we're still doing some work on this. We know at least eight of those individuals in the 110 are Minnesota residents. And so again, when you try to net some of this out, there's as we were reporting North Dakota numbers, uh, you'll have to take that in consideration. But given that all of these uh, team members work in North Dakota, that all of them are in the Altru or the North Dakota Health Service area, uh, as we've been saying uh, from the get-go on this whole thing, that we're gonna be taking a look at the counties uh, 
that border uh, and are part of the service area in Minnesota and treating those as part of our hospital planning and treating those as part of our rapid response plan because uh, those individuals may live in East Grand Forks but they're gonna be likely receiving care from a North Dakota provider. Uh, the final 52 tests uh, that are not yet run through the lab will, that, that will be completed by this evening. Uh, and, when the, uh, and then we've also been following up, uh, of course, with a extensive contact tracing, uh, and we'll know exactly uh, how many uh, team members, how many uh, household residents uh, and others that they may have had close contact. The individual case investigations uh, will continue and be ongoing, but in conversation with Debbie Swanson today uh, from the Grand Forks Public Health Department, uh, we've got over 20 people deployed uh, working specifically just on LM contact tracing and we'll bring more resources to bear uh, as needed. Uh, one thing I wanna add with this plant closure, uh, uh, GE uh, has uh, been a, a great corporate citizen in that as they're asking their employees to stay home during this time period, uh, but in addition to that, they are paying their employees uh, during this two weeks uh, that the plant is closed. Uh, they're also doing thorough plant cleaning uh, that's already been started. They're doing that uh, while the plant is closing. But the, there's a key piece of news here, which is that given that uh, quarantine and isolation are critically important uh, at this juncture to prevent further spread, uh, therefore as authorized by North Dakota law, State Health Officer Mylan Tufty today is issuing a quarantine order for all LM Wind Power employees. Uh, and then we say all, this would be all those that worked in the plant, whether they've tested positive, tested negative, or not been tested. Uh, and again, uh, we wanna, uh, for the public, uh, wanna help people understand, particularly since there's been a lot of talk uh, in our state and nationally about reopening. We've also said that uh, we could be open, it could be next August, it could be next November, and you could have an outbreak like this. And if we have an outbreak and we wanna stay open, uh, then we have to do the targeted approach. And the targeted approach is that we come in and we make sure that we uh, identify those positives, those who have had close contacts with positives, those household members with positives, and then those people either self-isolate uh, voluntarily or in this case uh, are covered under a quarantine order. Uh, we know that, uh, <clears throat> that in a city the size of Grand Forks, if you've got this many positives and this many potential uh, team members, uh, that, that we could have rapid spread. Uh, and again, we had to put that out today. It cannot be delayed because it would jeopardize uh, the local ability uh, to control the community transmission of this contagious disease. And again, we've talked before about direct contact and community tracing. Uh, if you've got an outbreak like this in a plant where people are working closely together, uh, then we can identify where they got it and how they got it. If those folks can stay out of the community, uh, then we have an opportunity for us to slow down the spread and make sure that we can keep people safe, particularly those that we're focused on every day, which is protecting uh, the elderly and those that have underlying health conditions, uh, particularly those that are in congregate living situations of which there are many uh, nursing homes and assisted living in Grand Forks County. Uh, and so part of this stay home, of course, is to protect uh, those uh, individuals. Individuals must remain in their homes or places of resident during the period of quarantine. They've got to cooperate with local and state health officials. They must participate in the contact tracing efforts uh, and they must remain at home unless otherwise authorized by Department of Health and instructed to please contact the Department of Health or their providers if any COVID-19 symptoms occur, fever, cough, etc. By responding swiftly to these localized outbreaks and using targeted testing, we can quickly identify individuals uh, and begin the contact tracing process to prevent further disease from spreading. Uh, this process uh, worked as designed in Grand Forks. It also worked last week in Montreal County when we went into Montreal County after a initial outbreak there and we're able to uh, <clears throat> demonstrate our response capabilities, our testing capability, and our contract tracing to slow the spread and save lives as well as livelihoods. 
uh, as the number of North Dakota positive 19 cases uh, in North Dakota rise, uh, have risen sharply the last few days, we urge all North Dakotans to continue to practice physical distancing, uh, avoid gatherings of 10 or more, uh, avoid hosting them or attending them, uh, implement proper safeguards in your workplaces, and follow other CDC guidelines. And regarding uh, proper safeguards in the workplaces, again, uh, there was a number of things that were done by LM Wind and Power in advance of this, uh, but again, this is probably a good recognition for all employers who've got people who work in situations where they maybe have difficulty maintaining uh, the full physical distance of six feet or more throughout the workday. Uh, again, inviting and asking all employers, because again, the majority of our state is still open. Uh, all of energy, all of ag, all of healthcare, uh, education, well, to distance learning is still operating, uh, and any other businesses that were that were part of that uh, work that they do, including uh, government work and city work, whether it's uh, police departments, fire departments, garbage, all the services that are going, the large swath of our economy that's still going, we ask anyone who's, in, who's uh, managing teams that work in large areas like this uh, to make sure that you're reviewing your safeguards in those workplaces. The good news is we've only had one hospitalization so far among LM Wind Power employees who've tested positive. Uh, because, and, and again, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the average, uh, average number of days uh, between onset of symptoms and hospitalization in North Dakota has been six days. Uh, the maximum time from onset to hospitalization has been 13 days. And so, well, we have a lot of hospital capacity left as we've talked about. Uh, usually that's been arriving, you know, sort of one week to two weeks after the onset of symptoms. We hope that no one that tested positive is gonna need hospitalization, but this is the reason uh, why the 14 day period, because we've got to cover sort of the whole arc of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of this disease. Uh, We've, we do have, uh, you're we're gonna hear shortly uh, from uh, Mayor Brown and uh, Dr. Weiser uh, to talk about how they've got adequate capacity and how, how they're handling things well there in Grand Forks. Uh, but it should also be noted uh, that uh, for those that maybe haven't uh, made the connection, but LM Wind Power Plant is considered a critical manufacturing business by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security uh, and was not subject to any of the business closures we've ordered during the COVID-19 emergency. And if it had been in any other state in the nation uh, that had sheltered home or stay at home orders, it also would have been excluded from those because of its designation uh, as a critical manufacturing business under the Department of Homeland and security guidelines. Uh, <clears throat> next up, uh, by phone, uh, we'd like to invite uh, Mayor Brown uh, to make a few remarks. And I, as, as he comes online, I want to thank uh, Mayor Brown. Uh, he's been a great collaborator uh, with the state of North Dakota even before uh, the the pandemic, uh, but we've had great communications and great uh, teamwork uh, from uh, Grand Forks, all the work that they were doing up there prior with the Main Street Initiative, we deeply appreciate. And he and his team uh, have done a great job here. And of course, it uh, doesn't hurt that he's also a medical doctor uh, <clears throat> and has personally delivered a large portion of the people that now vote for him. Uh, so as an OBGYN. So anyway, uh, uh, Mayor Brown, uh, great to have you on the phone, uh, take it away. Thank you, Governor Burgum. We were hoping to avoid something like this, but we planned for it and prepared for it. We've identified and are isolating the problem and are doing everything we can to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 so we don't overwhelm our healthcare system. My sincere gratitude goes to you, Governor Burgum, for the forward thinking and the piloting of these mass testing events like the one conducted in Slope County. The state and the rapid response team worked well with local officials and the event well as designed. This mass testing done locally at LN Wind Power allowed Grand Forks to look for positive cases instead of waiting for them. LN Wind Power and employees have been a proud part of the Grand Forks story for over 20 years, and we thank them for their partnership in this response. We're working collaboratively with all true health systems, the state of North Dakota, LN Wind Power to identify and mitigate and contain the spread, and we expect more positive cases to be identified in the following days. We anticipate this to be a prolonged battle as said before, this will be a marathon, not a sprint. 
These efforts are all part of a partnership and a common mission to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in Grand Forks and the state of North Dakota. The partnership between our public and private sector entities includes the city, state health department, North Dakota National Guard, our health care system, and ultimately the citizens of Grand Forks. I have faith and confidence that what we have in place can and will work. The citizens of Grand Forks are an essential part of this partnership. We need to stay home, only go out for essential trips, practice physical distancing, sanitize frequently used services, and practice good hygiene. Stay home for our nurses and doctors. Stay home for our public health professionals. Stay home for our police officers and firefighters. Stay home for our elderly population. Stay home for those with pre-existing conditions. I call on the good nature and moral fortitude of the citizens of Grand Forks to follow the CDC state and city guidelines. They are no longer recommendations and guidelines to follow, but mitigation efforts that are expected to be taken. We expect you to stay home except for only physical trips. We expect you to wear face covering in public. We expect you to stay six feet away from others when possible. We expect you to frequently sanitize surfaces. And we expect you to take responsibility for the health of Grand Forks. We all love this community and your community needs you to be North Dakota smart. Thank you, Governor Berger. Thank you, Mayor Brown. And next up, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Stephen Weiser uh, from uh, Altru. And again, Altru has been one of the providers in our state that's been a great collaborator to this uh, entire effort. Uh, and they've been a key part of the Grand Forks community for a long time. Dr. Weiser. Good afternoon, Governor Brown, and thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, Governor Burgum, and thank you, Mayor Brown, for the kind words. Um, Ultra Health System has been working as the community as, is the community health system for Grand Forks and the surrounding region. We've been working closely with our partners in public health, as well as the mayor and the North Dakota, North Dakota Department of Health, ensuring that appropriate testing and care for COVID-19 patients over the past five weeks now. Prior to this week, Altru had completed the majority of testing in our communities. Until recently, we were managing a relatively no, low number of cases, but that changed this week. As our governor shared, the state and local public health department led a mass testing event related to this cluster on Thursday. We thank the state for their strong, swift response in holding this event. The results of this event have greatly increased the total cases in Grand Forks in a very short period of time. While Altru has a very strong plan in place to accommodate a surge in our hospital, it is more imperative than ever for the citizens of our community to adhere to the expectations put forth by our public health officials, our health system, our city leader, and our governor. Now is the time to slow and contain the spread of this virus. Altru will continue to offer testing for those who meet state guidelines. Our screening hotline remains open 24-7. Our sick clinic is open extended hours and on the weekend to care for those with respiratory symptoms. Our first responders and emergency room have strict protocols in place to care for those with severe symptoms. We currently have a dedicated inpatient unit for those with COVID-19 or those who are awaiting test confirmation. Our surge plan includes a tiered approach that can accommodate up to 292 beds and 33 ICU beds. We currently have 88 ventilators in stock. Given the models we have available today, Altru will confidently care for the current positive cases in our area. The important step now is stopping the spread of continuing, practicing isolation and quarantine procedures when directed, and physical distancing for all. Altru's priority has and has always been the safety of our patients, staff, and our community. Our staff are on the front line, and they will stay there for you. We thank our partners at the state and public health for their swift response to this situation at hand and their continued collaboration in the weeks ahead. Thank you, Governor Burgum, for this time today. Thank you, Dr. Weiser, and again, thanks for you and your team and all all you're doing. And I I know that uh, that that the, the uh, locals in Grand Forks can find that hotline number. I'm sure on the uh, Altru website uh, as well, and we'll maybe uh, make sure that we get it uh, get that information out as well. But thank you for that. Uh, 
next topic uh, relates to uh, homelessness. As we know that uh, homelessness is a uh, situation for uh, some people in our state, uh, and while we wish it wasn't so, it is. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about homelessness uh, where people may think that this is a permanent population. The reality is uh, people move in and out of, of this uh, state, uh, and it can happen to, uh, to young mothers. It can happen to uh, unaccompanied adults. Uh, it can happen to uh, anybody of any age. And when it does, it's usually... Uh, with that condition of homelessness, uh, there's also the co-occurrence of uh, physical health issues and mental or behavioral health issues. And so this population, uh, we know that, that, that having, a, ha, having health in your life starts with having a safe, healthy home. Uh, many of these folks that are currently in homelessness have been in uh, shelter uh, or shelter situations at times. Uh, we had a uh, description here by Chris Jones a few days ago talking about some of the efforts, uh, but we do know that outbreaks can happen anytime you've got congregate living uh, situations. And <clears throat> the We've been paying particularly close attention to these populations that might be at risk due to age, underlying conditions, or circumstances. Uh, and, it, and it's being at a greater risk does not mean that an individual is a greater threat of spread. Uh, it just means that we must uh, support them uh, with the right kind of supports. Yesterday, a DHS from North Dakota announced a new temporary shelter program to serve vulnerable individuals who are homeless and cannot stay at existing homeless or domestic violence shelters because they've tested positive uh, for COVID-19. And when you test positive for COVID-19, you fall under the quarantine orders that we previously issued. So this new program, uh, serving those with truly a nowhere else to go, uh, is serving 12 people across communities in North Dakota. Uh, and if needs grow, the program can be expanded to serve homeless individuals who need to self-isolate or in we're offering uh, this opportunity in Bismarck, Devils Lake, Dickinson, Fargo, Grand Forks, Jamestown, Minot, and Williston. Local human service zone offices will work directly with any individuals or families that are referred uh, to the program by a homeless shelter, a domestic violence shelter, a hospital, a public health unit, or other partner agencies. It's important uh, that people must be referred. Uh, shelter location information, uh, you know, you can find those locally, uh, and any one of those can then refer you to local human service office. Uh, regional human service centers will provide homeless case management services to participants in temporary shelter programs, and will also make sure that they've got access to nursing support and meals. This temporary shelter program supports our ability to serve vulnerable North Dakotans who are unable to quarantine in a home of their own and prevent outbreaks from occurring within vulnerable populations that are served by our homeless or domestic violence shelters. We all have a responsibility, uh, individual in responsibility to be North Dakota smart. And as a state, we are also working to protect uh, our most vulnerable citizens from potential outbreaks and provide services to keep them safe. Uh, thank you. Uh, for joining us today. We appreciate very much your, your being here. Got a couple of quick announcements before we go to questions. And uh, first, first one is on uh, the uh, pandemic unemployment back payments, which we know this is something we're working. I referenced this with our, our aging uh, mainframe computer. Uh, we've, again, there's been great work that's going on by the team over there that's kept it going for these past decades, as well as uh, NDIT and our, our uh, vendor partners that are helping us. Uh, there was about, <clears throat> uh, because of the high volume, uh, and we've got to pay by back weeks. There was about 60,000 back weeks. So take number of number of people times number of weeks, and that's how you get 60,000 back weeks. Uh, uh, many of the individuals, you know, had more than one week of these uh, FPUC payments on the list. Uh, we were able to come up with a workaround, but the workaround wasn't allow us to do a run where we could could do all 60,000 at one time. So we split it into three runs over three days. So uh, 20,848 weeks uh, worth of checks uh, were completed uh, through Friday night. Uh, that amounted to $12,676,389. Uh, that 
amount should be in claimants' accounts on Monday. Uh, we've got two more runs of this 20,000 plus uh, that will likely be similar dollar amounts uh, and we'll be running uh, those, uh, att attempting to get them run over this weekend uh, if we can keep the system up and running. But again, I wanna thank uh, the team over there for their uh, creativity and diligence and around the clock work uh, to deal with this uh, unprecedented load. Uh, of work. Uh, of course, North Dakota Smart, uh, which we've uh, talked about uh, and you see up on the slide here, uh, the, again, all of these uh, same principles stay in place uh, that we've talked about over and over. Uh, stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. You heard Mayor Brown talk about this, but uh, when we have outbreaks like this, we want to we want to target them with testing, like we did, which is going to drive our percent of positives up. We want to get in quickly with the quarantine for those people who may have been exposed, and that allows us to stay on a path for the North Dakota Smart restart. Uh, but again, the North Dakota Smart restart is going to be driven by data and numbers, not by the calendar. Two of the criteria in the federal program for reopening include a drop in your case count and a drop in your 14-day average uh, and in the case of North Dakota right now we're going up in both of those cases versus going down so the North Dakota smart guidelines more important than ever uh, if you're someone uh, that's interested in making sure we have a North Dakota smart restart as soon as possible uh, then all the more uh, important that, we, that to follow these rules right now because we know there are more active cases in North Dakota now than there ever has been uh, uh, and so therefore the potential positive contact with an active case or someone else who's had contact with a contact is greater than ever. And so these rules are uh, more important than ever. And then uh, lastly, on a note of gratitude, uh, before uh, we go to Q&A, I wanna say, uh, I bring another quote today, a quick one, uh, but it, the quote uh, uh, is that nothing is more beautiful or powerful than an individual acting out of his or her conscious uh, because by doing so, they thus help bring to the collective conscious to life. And again, we've talked a lot about individual responsibility, but it is a beautiful thing when people are exercising their individual responsibility and as part of that individual responsibility uh, to themselves, to their family, uh, and to society, they can help uh, keep North Dakota safe, particularly those who are most vulnerable that we're working every day uh, to try to protect them from this deadly disease. With that, we'll stand for questions. And again, thanks everybody for being here today. Radio legend Dave Thompson, quick out of the box, first hand up today. It's be fairly, maybe a little bit more esoteric, but Governor, do you know about the number of people who were tested, how many were from Minnesota and how many Minnesotans were positive? Uh, we, we, I asked that question at a conference call about uh, two hours ago and they're digging, trying to dig up that answer. We do know what I did share today, that eight of the one, eight of the known today of the 110 are known to be Minnesota residents. So the you know, vast majority right now appear to be North Dakota residents. We'll go online and then come back over here. Uh, Matt Henson with WDAY. Uh, do we know how many of the positive cases were asymptomatic? Uh, that's part of the investigation, Matt, that's still going on. We did not have that at the press time today. But when that, they'll continue to do the, the case tracking on all of the remaining ones. We'll get some more testing results in tonight and then we'll have more information on Monday on that. Jeremy and then Jacob. This might be a question for Mylin as well. Um, I'm wondering if the quarantine order for LM workers also applies to people who live with them, whether they're family or just a roommate, something like that. I, could you hear the question, Mylin? I think I know the answer, but I want to make sure I can confirm. And the, and the question was, uh, does it apply to people that live with them? And it, and it does not. It applies to the uh, people that, are, that were employed by LM Wind Power. So the actual quarantine order uh, that has the uh, effect of the state health officer is for the employees. Uh, we are, of course, asking you know, if as we've had all along, if you are living with someone who's positive, presumed positive, waiting for a test result, uh, we would ask that those people also follow the guidelines as well. But the quarantine order specifically only goes to the employees. Do you think that that fact will limit the effectiveness of the order? Yeah, compliance, uh, if you have low compliance, it limits the effectiveness. But, but in this case, uh, we felt, again, we're trying to have the right uh, touch of uh, applying 
available law with uh, appealing to individual responsibility. Uh, we know that uh, the that, that GE uh, LM has also asked their employees voluntarily to stay home uh, as well. So we think that uh, between their employer who's paying them and the state a quarantine order plus uh, the appeal to social and you know responsibility and individual responsibility will hopefully for everyone in the Grand Forks area get good compliance on this. Uh, we do know that uh, that of course some people that are that may be you know, hearing right now at this press conference that they've been quarantined. So, you know, we know that may uh, come uh, in addition to the, hey, our plant's closed, but you're going to get paid and we'd like you to stay home. Now we put the quarantine on top of that. This is something we've talked about with the with the mayor, but there's a number of services in Grand Forks uh, that are available that they're going to coordinate with LM. Uh, if people need to have food brought to them, medical supplies uh, to support people during their quarantine, because not, not everyone not everyone that works there may have a full network to support them. And so, uh, again, to avoid everybody having to rush out to get two weeks of supplies right now, uh, again, we wanted people to know that there is uh, support systems in place to help support people in quarantine. We'll go to online and then Lane. Uh, Adam Kurtz with the Grand Forks Herald. Can you explain the difference between self-isolation and quarantine? And how is a quarantine order enforced? Uh, Mylin, do you want to come up and take that one? And you, you got the question? Okay. So the question about what's the difference between isolation, self-isolation and quarantine. Um, on self-isolation, those are for individuals that have been symptomatic or tested positive. And they, the goal with self-isolation is to separate yourself from the other contacts that you might expose yourself to in your household. If there's a way that you could isolate from them, that would be very important. On quarantine, quarantine is that you haven't tested positive yet, but you have come into contact with someone that we know that has tested positive, and we want you to stay at home for 14 days because you could still develop COVID-19 within that full 14-day period. And then how is the quarantine order enforced, and specifically how will the LM order be enforced? So a quarantine order is enforced at the local level and for LM, this would apply for them as well. And the employer has done everything to, is, is helping to support that. Lane. Yeah, I might have missed this, but did you, um, are all the employees that work there at LM being tested and is that all being done at one time or are we spreading that out? Uh, the testing that was done on this past week did not cover all 900 employees. Uh, I think there was 425 tests that were taken, uh, and that was a combination of three things. It was a combination of people that were uh, <clears throat> in close contact with the ones that had previously tested positive. Uh, it was other close contacts of people that maybe may have been household members or others that weren't employees but were invited to come and go through the drive-through testing. Uh, and then there was also a randomized surveillance test of some people that were not known to be in close contact with the original positives, but just to try to get a, a sense of, of some ASMS, a, asymptomatic testing of people that weren't there. Uh, we do intend, uh, and uh, General Dorman's here to talk about it if we need to get into more detail, but the, we would likely uh, get back up into Grand Forks uh, with another drive-through testing effort uh, sometime this next week. As my Lynn just indicated, the incubation can occur over a period of time, and if we you know, rushed up and tested uh, another 500 people that were asymptomatic today, we may not get very many positives because if you don't have, if you may have it, but if you don't have enough viral load, uh, if your symptoms haven't developed, uh, it, you know, if, you're, if the virus hasn't developed in your body, you may not show up. So we may be more uh, productive at identifying positives, uh, you know, early next week. And so that's in, in work. Uh, but Dr. Weiser is on the, the phone from All True. We also have indicated they have enough testing supplies right now. They've had drive-through testing going seven days a week at All True. Uh, if people, you know, 
are symptomatic today or have concerns or feel like they've been in close contact, they should call the All True hotline uh, and, and go through a phone screening with them and then determine whether or not they should be tested. But All True has enough test kits to keep testing through this weekend and we're in the process of getting more test kits to them in, in addition to the possibility of doing another rapid response, large scale testing effort up there early next week. So yeah, testing is, testing is gonna continue. Jeremy? that um, is there an exception to this order for workers who would like to get tested uh, I'm, I'm sorry on the to understand that an, an exception how can they, can they leave their homes to get tested uh, yes of course uh, you, you know you can if you uh, are <clears throat> and, I, and I'm sure there's a way that we handle that my lens nodding yes uh, but there would be for you know medical medical conditions I mean if someone's getting sicker uh, and you're either self-isolating at home, you know, you call your provider and go get additional care. I mean, that's not, we're not excluding people getting uh, medical care through any of these orders. I also have a question for Dr. Weiser. If okay, Dr. Floor. Weiser, a question from you from Jeremy Turley from Forum News Service, if you're still on the line. Um, doctor, if this reaches the level of the outbreak at the Smithfield plant in Sioux Falls, um, does Grand Forks have the medical infrastructure? Does the healthcare system have the... Um, bandwidth to withstand that kind of outbreak? Yes, as I stated in my opening remarks, based on the projections so far on the percentages that we're looking at, we do, and we have a tiered approach to address that and based on how we shift our staffing. As I could, from my understanding, there was a total of 65 that became hospitalized out of that outbreak, which which is a good number considering the number of people affected. So we have to remember that a lot of people recover this with minimal to no symptoms, and that's above the 80% range, and only about 5% or so truly get critically ill, so. Thank you. And for clarity for the viewers, the 65 hospitalizations that the doctor was talking to related to the South Dakota meatpacking uh, plant ratios. Uh, and, and again, uh, Jeremy, on your question, uh, do we have enough capacity? The other reason why we built the state surge plan is uh, that if one community like Grand Forks got overwhelmed, uh, there's been a long history uh, in just in, I would say, regular times. Uh, Dr. Weiser described that to me earlier today, but if they uh, needed assistance from uh, hospitals say in the Fargo area, then they've had the ability to transport patients down there. And, we've, and so we have a lot of capacity in the eastern part of the state. And so uh, A, Eltru's got enough, we should be in good shape, but uh, before we would even get into some of the other tiered plans we talked about, the simplest thing would be just transfer patients to uh, you know one hour away to where we've got a lot of capacity. We'll go back online. Dave Kolpak with the Associated Press in Fargo. Uh, due to LM's designation by Homeland Security as a critical manufacturing business, does that mean they could not have been shut down even uh, if you had wanted to? Uh, I think, Dave, you're asking a legal question, which I've not explored the answer to. Uh, but I can tell you by intention, we never had any desire to shut down, uh, you know, critical infrastructure. Uh, in North Dakota, uh, regardless of what the feds may or may not have said, but clearly they were designated as a uh, as part of that federal designation by Homeland Security. But it was a legal question that we never never addressed. But I guess I could look it up. But again, we're we're trying to get things back open. We're not trying to close more things down. And the way we get thing more things open is targeted testing, self isolation, quarantine and great contact tracing. Well, that's, that's the game plan to get open and uh, that's, all, that's all happening uh, with, this LM, uh, with this LM situation. Jacob? We'll go back online. Governor, when uh, we first started holding these daily briefings, you said if you are early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. Doesn't the concept of uh, doing targeted testing after an outbreak is identified an indication that you're not being early? No, uh, it's not. I think the what is would be discussed to do testing before an outbreak would be called surveillance testing, uh, and very little of that has happened in the in our entire country because as testing supplies ramped up. I mean, the closest thing uh, that that's happened to uh, you know anywhere 
in any of the states around us would be what we did in Slope County, where we went in to do a large amount of testing in a county that, that had, at the time we planned to do it had no positives. Uh, and so that was uh, that kind of surveillance testing, that kind of surveillance testing, or as Dr. Brooks calls it, uh, sentinel testing, which is your like a, a sentinel that's out there on front in a military terms. It's an early line of defense, you know, that's sort of on guard. Uh, and we would hope as we go forward in the weeks and months ahead that we could be doing uh, sentinel or surveillance testing more broadly across the whole state where you might be doing a, a sampling of testing in every county uh, every week. Uh, even with people that are asymptomatic to just try to sort of, you would find it before, before they even know it's here, before people even know they have it, you get some alert. But the best practice, what we're talking about now, which we've done uh, like we did in Montreal and now we're doing in Grand Forks County is, is when you have a group of positives like we had those eight, uh, if we hadn't gone up and said, we're gonna do 425 tests of people that were known or whatever, we wouldn't have come up with a, the big numbers we came up with today. So this is exactly what we wanna do. We're hunting for positives so we can identify them. Uh, in some cases, you're identifying before they've even become ill, and then you have the self-isolation or quarantine uh, the orders that go in, and, and that helps slow the spread in a targeted way versus ha us having to uh, you know, more broadly uh, ask everybody to uh, be in compliance about staying home. So I'd say strategies working, and this has been, this is, like I said, this is happening now, uh, could be happening three months from now, six months from now, uh, and we'll have the skill to do it. As I said the other day, we have to have the ability right now to be able to do this in multiple communities at the same time. We're fortunate these are kind of coming up one, one day at a time, but we want to be, have that rapid response testing and contact tracing capability to do these around the state simultaneously with the form of Fargo-Moorhead, are there any plans to do testing in other factories or food processing plants in North Dakota that have large numbers of employees? And is the state doing inspections to make sure these large employers are following guidelines? Uh, two questions. The first one, uh, it's certainly part of a longer term plan uh, that we would be trying to do more testing when we've got large populations working in these kinds of uh, facilities. Uh, as is the case, however, uh, if you've got a population that is generally uh, working in a manufacturing setting might generally be younger and healthier, uh, say for example, versus where we've got in congregate living. And as testing supplies come available, healthcare workers, first responders, people that are coming in contact with COVID, uh, and in particularly the people that are entering our long-term care facilities, uh, the people that are going to work there every day, uh, that's we would direct resources likely to those more vulnerable populations before we would just go out and start testing uh, all manufacturing plants. Uh, but as again, as I've said before, uh, the, if there was a, you, you know, there will come a time when there is such low cost broad based testing that employers themselves uh, might be doing this testing uh, because no employer wants to have an outbreak. I mean, the, the most valuable thing for any employer is their team members in this environment. And that's absolutely true when you're in an environment which we will likely return to where you've got a period of, where you have, we've gone through a period where you have more people uh, more jobs available than people looking for jobs. Uh, workforce protection is one of the important skills of any successful company. And that testing of your team members and workforce safety uh, might have used to mean slip and fall. And it's also now gonna mean workforce safety in terms of protecting against uh, contagion uh, as part of those practices uh, that you'll, you'll see. And, and, uh, and I think we'll see that at workforce safety conferences. We'll see it all over. There's gonna be a bigger component of that going forward. And I think April had a second question was who's enforcing, uh, who, who might do or who's, who would do inspections. Uh, and, and right now, uh, again, uh, inspections related to health fall on local public health officers and they are uh, you know, severely strained uh, as is any health organization in our country right now uh, because of the immense uh, workload that's going on. And so right now we'd be looking uh, to, in, to uh, you know, business groups, employers and others, uh, because again, there's a lot of economic, there's a lot of economic incentive for, for any manufacturer to make sure that they're doing all the very best practices in terms of keeping their employees safe and healthy. So I'm not, 
uh, overly concerned about compliance uh, at those right now because of the strong economic incentive they have to comply. Dave? Governor, I think I heard you say that 20 people were working on contact tracing out of this LM thing. Is that uh, yeah, a lot of the Grand Forks, uh, led by uh, uh, Debbie Swanson out of the Grand Forks uh, Public Health Group, but she's got her team. Uh, we brought in some more from other health areas around the state uh, that currently weren't, you know, that had some capacity. Uh, and I should, when I say brought in, not necessarily physically there, but they're, you know, given a list of names and they're doing the phone interviews because contact tracing is largely uh, phone interviews. Uh, we've also uh, pulled in uh, nursing students from uh, UND Public Health and NDSU Public Health. There's, you know, great programs there in public health, masters of public health programs. Some of those have already had training and that's where we get uh, up to this 20 number. But as we talked on the phone earlier today, uh, we'll bring in even more resources, uh, particularly if we go back next week and we do another wave of testing up there of this same kind of scale, we may need to bring even more resources to bear. Well, then you think there's going to be more ramping up of contact tracing? Well, statewide, absolutely. I mean, this is one of our priorities. Is I mean, we've talked about uh, that we've got we've got to go from uh, you know we were at tens, uh, you know we might be in hundreds, but you know in my in my mind I feel like we've got to have uh, units all over the state, and maybe it's you know maybe it's a thousand people by the time we get done uh, that are working on this because you'd want to have them to be able you know deploy locally. You'd want to be able to have them deploy at, you know, within. Uh, I would envision that you'd have that capability within the, the sovereign five nations that we have, uh, that we share geography with. So I think it's, it's a big, large scale capability that is going to have to exist until such time that there's a vaccine. You can ask one more and then back to online. Um, was there any way that this outbreak could have been prevented referring to the outbreak at LM? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, the, in terms of, uh, because again, we have a highly contagious, uh, you know, highly contagious disease that is spread uh, very easily, and and we we know that uh, even in places where we've got great precaution, like a nursing home where we've restricted visitors for five weeks, uh, where they're practicing hygiene within there. We know we've had outbreaks in every state in the country in places where we're desperately trying to keep it out. Now in manufacturing places where you've got 900 people coming and going every day, uh, who've also got you know families and they're shopping and groceries and all that stuff. I mean, the number of potential transmissible moments gets to be, you multiply people times potential other people they see times places they've been, uh, it would be really, really challenging uh, to, to, uh, to sort of say, hey, we're going we're gonna to prevent that. Okay. Steve, Hall, Steve Hallstrom, WZFG Radio in Fargo. Um, we've had reports that some hotels are being prepped to act as the temporary homeless shelters you had mentioned. How are these hotels handling individuals so that other guests can feel confident that they are safe from the virus? And will these individuals be monitored to make sure they're complying with any quarantine orders and in, in line with self-isolation? The, the last part of that is, uh, yes, they will be monitored and supported. Uh, and again, uh, the, this program that's running through Department of Human Services is, uh, you know, hotels, uh, that that volunteered to be part of a sheltering program did so on a voluntary basis. Uh, we do know that uh, one of the other things when you reduce travel, uh, whether it's uh, air, air travel, road travel, and all the travel restrictions that one of the sectors uh, that has uh, been had a big drop off in occupancy is the hotel sector. And uh, some of those, some hotels have closed uh, voluntarily, others are or, uh, just due to lack of business, others have, uh, have remained open. Uh, and some are, you know, seeing this as a way where they can participate as a community member, support the community and help serve those in need. Uh, and all those, all the safeguards have been put in place to make sure that uh, there's, they can create that separation uh, in these cases. So uh, Department of Human Services and the local shelters, I think doing a great job. We're talking about, uh, I, I would say, uh, 
what did we say there's 12 people currently in the program. I don't know right off the top of my head how many hotel rooms there are in the state. I know there's more than 5,000 just in the Fargo area alone. And so uh, we're talking about, you know, one teeny two tenths of 1% uh, if they're all in Fargo, but the 12 rooms are spread around the state. So this is a, uh, this would clearly be considered a rounding error uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of occupancy, but it's uh, really welcomed uh, that these organizations are stepping up, acting as community members and supporting those people in need. One more online, and this is the last one. Sydney Mook with the Grand Forks Herald. Do we know if the LM cases were contained to a certain part of the plant? Uh, we don't know that, and uh, based on the fact that we have a, a 110 positives so far with more tests coming uh, and I think it's safe to assume uh, that it was widespread within the plant uh, and and that's why again uh, GELM is responsibly shut down the entire plant and is cleaning the whole plant. With that, I, again, I'll just say uh, gratitude for uh, particularly uh, thanks to the media that rallied over here on a on a Saturday afternoon, on a beautiful Saturday afternoon, and for the uh, North Dakotans that are watching, uh, hope you're getting a chance to get a breath of fresh air in a in a uh, with with a dose of individual responsibility. As I uh, was coming uh, here for the press conference today, there was a group of people that were at least 10 feet apart from each other holding an exercise class on the steps of the Capitol. Not something I'd seen before. One of them was wearing a pink tutu. Uh, so anyway, people are having a lot of fun out there uh, doing uh, some pretty aggressive uh, step work on the Capitol steps out in front. So enjoy the fresh air, uh, get exercise, stay healthy, and uh, keep being North Dakota smart. And again, thank you, Mayor Brown. Uh, thank you, Dr. Weiser. Uh, and thanks to uh, all the people in local public health, the National Guard, and others that uh, that acted so so quickly uh, to allow us to get up and start containing uh, this situation that occurred in Grand Forks County. So thank you all, and we'll see you Monday at 3:30, assuming we don't have another uh, breaking news story tomorrow. But hopefully we'll have have that. We'll see you on Monday at 3:30. Thank you. Stay healthy, North Dakota.